Hello everybody, Dr. Rick Wallace here, dropping in with a little special announcement for those who have followed me for any stretch of time. You know, outside of the businesses that I run, like Myriad Business Solutions, the Visionetics Institute, Odyssey Media Group, I also do a great deal of work inside of the inner city communities uh, in Houston, Dallas, and other areas. Uh, I'm asking now as we push a fundraiser that you support what the Odyssey Project is doing in the inner cities, uh, especially with programs like Black Men Lead, which is a rite of passage uh, initiative, and Restoring Ghetto for, Ghetto's Forgotten Daughters, which is a program focused on helping young girls, but boys as well, suffering from childhood sexual abuse, uh, rape, molestation, domestic abuse, uh, absentee fatherhood, and so many other things. Uh, the information will be in the box. Thank you. Dr. Rick dropping in on you. Hope everybody's having a great start to your week. Look, I'm going to try to get right into this. Uh, you saw the intro to this video. You know that we are in the midst of a fundraiser and have been and will be for the foreseeable future. We need your support. It's that simple. Uh, never has it been more evident and prevalent uh, to present this, more evident that it's needed, more prevalent that we present it. And here we are, the more prevalent the need and the more necessary for us to present it. Look, um, I get all types of reports and information that comes across my desk on a daily basis. Number one, I own a media company. Number two, I'm a part of a conglomerate black media company. Number three, I run an inner city organization that deals with uh, the enigmas and frustrations of the black community. So I offer services, I offer insight, I offer, I offer um, advocacy. And so someone's always looking for me to be aware of something so that I can uh, address it in whatever way that we are capable uh, of addressing it. And so I am constantly being bombarded with information about things we are doing in our communities that are detrimental to the things we say we desire. One is um, intimate partner violence and intimate partner homicide with black women normally getting the bad side of uh, this thing. Not that there aren't black women that have killed black men. I've got no stories, but um, normally it's a black male that has harmed, severely harmed, or taken the life of a black female. I've gotten stories of black men burning black women because they no longer want to be with them. I have them where they've shot them and stabbed them and left them for dead. Then I've seen where they've literally killed them. Uh, it's a problem when the second leading cause of death among black females between the ages of 15 and 44 is intimate partner violence. Um, I'm not concerned with what other people are doing. I'm not concerned with what other races are doing. What I'm saying is that it can never be acceptable for our people, for our women's number one threat or number two threat to their lives at a given point in time in their life is to come that threat is to come from the very ones they are supposed to be able to depend on to provide their safety uh there are so many things that are working against us there's so much that we are forced to deal with on any given time and for us to be consistently participating in our demise is a problem i've talked about this and I've written about it and I've lectured about it in great lengths. Over the past three weeks, I've had three different um, events that I have been the keynote speaker at, speaking on mental health for black men, speaking on the need for programs to help properly and effectively socialize young black men, to look at the development and uh, 
preparation of young black males to function in their manhood in a society and a culture that's constantly bombarding them with information and stimuli that suggests they are inferior, suggests they are animalistic, suggests that they are inherently criminalistic. And then to look at the fact that there are one point five million black men missing in America, between one point two and one point three million of those are in prison. Um, and 50 percent of those are going to recidivate within the first one to three years of being released. This is a competitive uh, this is a repetitive cycle that continues on. The problem starts much earlier than that. I've written on the disproportionality of special education as a weapon, um, that they are literally disproportionately referring young black males to special education assessments where they are being designated as oppositionally defiant, as ADHD and other things. And the problem with oppositional defiant disorder and ADHD, attention deficit hyper, hyperactive disorder is that it qualifies them to now be uh, medicated with psychotropic drugs we're talking about drugs that are schedule two drugs meaning that they are highly addictive and have very little uh, medicinal use within the spectrum of medications uh, they are mind altering uh, <clears throat> by way of chemical imbalance and other means and again, they are highly addictive. And this is what we're putting our five-year-olds. This is how early this starts. They're starting to assess them at five years old. Now, it's a business for them. Number one, it, 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 it initiates the school to prison pipeline. Why? Because the moment that you assess a kid as being um, in some way mentally disrupted or learning disabled, you start to alienate them from the learning process. You start to push them out in a place where they feel alone, where they don't feel like they belong, where they feel uh, singled out and attacked. And what it does is it increases their rate or uh, the likelihood of their risk of dropping out of high school. Well, we understand if we really have given uh, attention to the numbers, we know that once a, a, a male drops out of school, he becomes four to five times more likely to become incarcerated. Well, we understand once you become incarcerated, you expose yourself to a new institutional reality that shapes your view of the world and limits your functionality and acceptance once you return to the world. Another reason for the high recidivism rate. This is just a portion of the problem. But this 1.2 uh, million in prison, this total of 1.5 million missing, means that there's an entire gap in the natural, organic process of socializing young black males. This is not an all-out assault by Dr. Wallace on black men. I'm a black man. Uh, but as a black man, my first stance is manhood. I can't talk about what women need to do until I address what I need to do and what my brothers need to do. And then I can come to my sisters as I have in many times and say, hey, look, your slip is hanging. Let me show you where it's at. But at first, I need to deal with the things that are on deck because we're only going to get as far as our men lead us. We're only going to get as high as our women can spiritually lift us. And if we don't understand the connectivity in that, we'll destroy one another. We will continue to go down this path where this vitriol and this hatred and this and this pernicious force of engagement between us is literally killing us one way or another the life expectancy of the black man has dropped another three years that's huge it doesn't sound like much but it's absolutely astonishing when you look at the manner in which this 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 uh equation is created to come to that conclusion um black on black crime which i've dealt with and i've explained and i've i've, I've debunked um, in lectures, in my books, is not enough to explain the the drop in in life expectancy. First and foremost, uh, I'm not saying that fratric frat fratricide does not exist in the black community. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying that there aren't black kids out there killing one another. I'm not saying that um, that's not a problem. What I'm saying is it's not a racial phenomenon. 
it is a social reality. If you look at any group, you're going to find out that the vast majority of the violent crimes within that group are committed by other people within the group. 84% of homicides in the white community are committed by other white people, but we're never going to hear white on white crime because the narrative does not fit the reality that they are trying to create. And so we've got to be careful about that because black on black crime consistently pushes a narrative that blacks are inherently violent towards one another, that we are born with a violent gene. We are born with a criminal gene. It doesn't take into consideration the environmental influences that, that take place. It doesn't uh, take into consideration the socioeconomic influences that are a major part of this. It does not take into consideration the things that are out of place. It does not take into consideration something else that I've written on uh, intensively, and that is multi-generational transmission of trauma. If we don't understand how trauma is transmitted, written on it, from epigenetics to social learning theory uh, to re-injury, I've written on it extensively. If we don't understand it, we cannot uh, deal with and, and, and rebut it and to deal with and create solutions that allow us to come out of it. We can't heal until we set the environment to heal it. You can take any wound, any physiological wound, put it in the wrong environment, and it will fester. It will, it will become infected. It will not get better. It will get worse. Time does not heal all wounds. The right environment, the right energy, the right situation begins the healing process, the right behavior. Take, take time off from doing this. Don't do that. Don't touch it. Don't put it in this. Don't, all of these different things have to happen. And you, 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 depending on how well you manage the environment in which the wound needs to heal will tell how rapidly and successfully the wound heals. You break a leg if you don't set it right. If you don't take pressure off of it. If you don't eat the right um, type of nutrients to help strengthen that bone as it begins to heal. It will not heal properly and it, it, it will have limitations even when it heals or if it heals. And those are the same things that happen, have to happen within the human psyche, the human mind of a black person who has experienced trauma on top of trauma on top of trauma and then passed it down through, the epigen through epigenetics, through epigenetic tags, also through the environmental element and component, component of epigenetics. We're sim simply consistently immersed in trauma. Somebody's getting killed, somebody's getting stabbed, somebody's getting shot, whether it's in our community, whether it's on our television, somebody is dying that looks like us, and we are literally experiencing re-injury. We are being lynched uh, in, a, in a new way. It's, it's, it's a new form of lynching, and it's a powerful form of traumatization and demobilization, and we are not confronting it well. It's e the easy go-to is to look at this, and I'm talking about this because there's this beautiful young woman, 20 years old, to me, still a little little lady, 20 years old, named Jalen Crump in Zion, Illinois, who had her boyfriend blow her brains out because she didn't want to be with him anymore. 28-year-old, uh, convicted felon, paroled. Again, everything that aligns with everything I told you about the process that's set up and designed for young men to, to, to navigate, and, and, and far too many of them are ending up in this. And the desensitization of it comes in a certain way. It's nothing more devastating in the form, when it comes to manhood is to be improperly socialized, not given the proper tools to manage your emotions, in fact, being told that your emotions are a weakness and real men don't have them, that real men don't cry, real men don't feel pain, real men don't get their hearts broken, and then be in a situation where it happens and you feel hopeless and the only thing that you have at your disposal is the ability to destroy. It's inherent in you. It was, but here's the thing, and this is what we teach young black male, males and black men lead. This is what we teach them. This ability that you have to destroy wasn't meant for you to use against the very ones you were meant to protect. That pinch towards violence, that, 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 that stronger body, the, the stronger physicality of a male versus a female, 
the natural aggression that comes with high test testosterone production. That wasn't meant for you to harm her. That was meant to make sure you were capable and willing to protect her, to defend her, to cover her, even to the point of giving your life to make sure she's okay. That's what it's meant for. But when it's not properly inculcated into the psyche of a young black male by watching other black men effectively and properly deal with black women, when it's not a part of the natural cultural fabric of behavior of men, and then the men that aren't present to model it have left this gap for these young boys to figure out. It means at the time in which there's the most rapid rate of increase in testosterone production, which is an emotional trigger, which is a physiological force in which the body is changing, the voice is changing, the mentality is shifting, the, the personality and mood is changing, more agitated, more aggressive, but there's nobody there to help harness it. There's nobody there to help place it inside of a frame of perspective to say, this is what's going on with you, but it's okay because it's preparing you to do this. This is a part of what's going to establish your need, your place, and your acceptance in your community is that you are being developed right now to be a protector. You're developing right now to be a covering. You're developing right now to be a provider. You're developing right now to be out in front and leading and being the wall of, of, of insulation and, and, and protection against the things in this world that want to come into our community and harm those things that are most valuable to us. But, but see, because that's not there, they're trying to figure out and they're trying to find it at the time when they need the greatest guidance, they're left alone to figure it out. At the time that they're having the greatest yearning to be uh, 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 in front and on top or out in, in lead of something, they are being pushed to the background and, 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 and told to figure it out. At the same time that they're being told to figure it out, there's a massive media campaign ready to tell them who they are because they're people their leaders, their black men haven't shown them, haven't told them, haven't guided them, haven't given them what they need. And so now here it is, you're a criminal. Your greatest value is in being a thug. Your greatest value is in being misogynistic. Your greatest value is in how well you can manipulate, control, and dominate your woman. All of these things are the things that are being pushed in front of them, and this is the thing they know. So now any man that's seen that has a certain concern for women is seen as a simp. Any man that's willing to put himself behind a woman to make sure she's okay is seen as a simp. Any man that's willing to give his heart to a woman is seen as a simp. It is a it is a common thread being pushed. I've seen the interview where it is believed that loving a black woman is a sign of weakness. Where did it come from? It didn't come from real, true, authentic black men who live to love our women. It didn't come from that. So where did it come from? Where is this mindset that says I can mistreat a woman and still be accepted? It's what they're seeing. It's what's being pushed. It's what's literally falling in their lap. And it's because we're not properly socializing them. This is why I created Black Men League because there has to be something to fill the organic gap. Now, the, in, 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 a, in a functional culture where everybody's operating in their role, in their identity, the men will naturally be doing that. I grew up in, in, in an environment where that the, few, the few homes where there wasn't a man in the home were covered by all of the other men who were in the community because every man had his home he was responsible for, but he was also patrolling his streets and observing what was going on. And there were certain things you couldn't do in, in, in his vision in front of his house. And if you go down, it was a couple of more houses. There's another man. It was men in the, in, in, in the community that held the standard of performance and behavior by black boys. See, you couldn't be a little boy running around hitting on a little girl when I grew up. It wasn't allowed. Oh, I'm not saying that domestic violence didn't exist. It existed. Cheating men existed. Domestic violence existed. A bunch of other stuff that we see. But what I'm saying is the prevalence at which we see it now where it's literally accepted, where it's literally praised, where, uh, no, you know, all we get is a bunch of people on social media going, oh, my God. 
All we get is a bunch of people on social media going, that's horrible. All we get is a bunch of people on social media saying it's evil. What we don't have is a community coming together and saying enough is enough. What we don't have is people getting behind things that can change this. If we don't interrupt this consistent generational uh amplification of aberrant behavior but uh by literally sitting up saying this is what we're going to do frederick Douglass told us he said that it's easier to build strong men than it is to prepare broken it's easier to, to build strong children than it is to repair broken men and what we're looking at is an attempt to get broken men to behave as if they aren't broken to behave as if they aren't being challenged emotionally to behave as if they have been properly socialized and know their place, know their role, and have a sense of belonging and being needed in a community and in an environment where most of them are shunned, where most of them are looked at as the problem. And in many instances, they are. But it's our responsibility because we didn't properly prepare, uh, prepare them. I have said this when I wrote, man, 10 years ago, when I wrote... Um, Maybe longer than that, but man, getting old. Uh, when I wrote uh, The Miseducation of Black Youth in America, one of the things that it was important for me to do was to truly define uh, the term education as it pertains to what we need for our children. And my explanation was this, that education is not simply the attainment of academic skills. It is the holistic preparation and empowerment of young black youth to develop into adults who can go out into a world that's inherently hostile towards them and not only compete but win. That means we have to give them a sense of identity because an identity crisis is where the weakness is. The identity crisis is what is being attacked. The lack of awareness of oneself leaves you to seek identity and, 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 and assessment from someone else. If When you don't know who you are, you're consistently looking to someone else or something else to identify you. And many of these young men who are killing these women are looking to the women to validate them. The fact that I have this girl is why I'm, 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 I'm exceptional. The fact that I have this girl is the reason why I'm that dude. And the moment that this girl is no longer here, no, the, 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 the moment that this girl is gone and nobody's saying, man, he got this fine chick or he's got this, everything that you identify with that your boys are big up in you about is gone. And she's broken your ego. She, she shake, she's shaking your very world. And you can't control it. You can't convince her to come back. And now you're feeling hopeless. Now you're feeling weak because you set your identity on something outside of yourself because nobody taught you how to look within. The mind is an unbelievable thing. The mind is exceptional and extraordinarily powerful. The mind can unleash things unimaginable to the average person, but the mind has to be whole and healed in order to do it. And we're turning loose a bunch of sick young kids on themselves. When I'm trying to get people to understand this, and, 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 and while I'm talking about young black males, I'm talking about black youth in uh, uh, period, um, when I'm doing this, I'm trying to get people to understand one of the ways that I do this when I'm talking about young black males is if you're a man out there, if you're a black man with a daughter, you should be really concerned about this. Even though you're a black man and I'm talking about black men and it makes you feel uncomfortable. It makes you feel unappreciated. It makes you feel like you're not one of the guys out there holding it down. I've tried my best my entire life to hold it down. I've, I've, I've given myself in so many ways. I don't ever... Uh, uh, attempt to present myself as having been perfect. I haven't been the perfect husband. I haven't been the perfect father, but I've been a committed husband. I've been a committed father. I love my wife. I love my children. I never did things to harm them. I came in and I did the best I can to hold my family together. And the one thing that I could always say, and I can say it without reservation, is that nothing came to my family without coming through me. I didn't leave my family unprotected. I didn't leave my family unguarded. And what, what am I saying is that is something that's there. And so it can be easy for me to sit up and hear somebody talking about how trifling men are. It, it, it can be easy for me to become upset. It can, easy, it can be easy for me to be offended. It can be easy for me to sit up and take the defensive. But what I have to do as a black man is say, okay, I'm not doing it. But is there a means and a way for me to impact and mitigate and reduce the occurrence of those who are? Am I simply sitting back and saying, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, and I'm sitting back? Because if that's what I'm doing, if I'm saying I'm taking care of my family and I, I, I'm stopping there, now, that's the number one thing, yeah. 
take care of home first. But is, is that where my responsibility as a black man stops? I argue no. My responsibility as a black man is to represent my blackness by understanding that in and of myself and alone, there's only a limit to what I can do, even for my family. The, if I can unite black men, if I can strengthen black men, if I can educate and empower black men, if I can give black men an identity, a purpose, and a sense of direction, if I can show them how they belong and why they are needed, I, I strengthen my capacity to be what I need to be in my home. Why? Because now I'm not doing it by myself. Now I'm not fighting and struggling to hold things up on my own. I have created a collaboration of men around me who will make sure I'm okay and I will make sure they're okay. We will stand together. We will unify. We will in and of ourselves as a collective present to the world the very thing they fear the most. An educated, powerful, unified, and purposed black man. But if I don't, if I sit back and I say, man, look at me. I got so many degrees. I've got so many companies. I'm doing this, I'm taking care of this. I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to do. I failed, I failed miserably. Something I said a long time ago, and I'm almost done, something I said a long time ago. I said that if I remain anomaly, if I re remain an anomaly in my community, I have failed as a man. What was I saying? I was saying is, if I am simply a rarity in my community. It means that I haven't touched enough lives. It means that I have not made a, 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 an emphatic enough impact on the people around me. What I need everyone who's watching this to understand is that it's time out for us sitting within the cocoons of our own individual existence and ignoring the fact that our inactivity is raging a, a, a uh, is a raging fire of destruction on the very ones that we identify with on the very ones that we look at on the very ones that we are so willing to judge and degradate because of their behavior we have a responsibility as being those who are successful as being those who have uh in some way uh mastered the capacity to navigate the labyrinthine corridors of racism and do fairly well in our lives we have a responsibility to reach back and touch the lives of those who are being stepped on and oppressed and pushed back and herded into destruction it's our responsibility we don't get to step back and look back and look down on them that's not how we're going to win we're going to have to stand together we're going to have to hold our ground we're going to have to speak firmly and forcefully in our lives and do what is necessary to bring about change Oh, I'm, I, I'm calling it out. Look, I've been telling you guys for a long time that we're doing this. I created these programs to go national, to create a national network, to be touched on, on, on a small scale. We've done some unbelievable things. I could easily sit up and say, man, look at what I've done. Look at how many lives I've changed. It's well over a thousand and it's growing. We got millions of people in this country. It's a drop in the bucket. We need to create a network. We need to grow this. We need to expand our reach because this is what I'm telling you. They're pumping billions into keeping us at bay. They're pumping billions into a distorted view of black manhood. They're pumping billions into pushing a gender war to keep black men and black women divided. They're pumping billions into a propaganda campaign that expresses and shows the young black male as a hypersexual, animalistic, and misogynistic and dr dr uh, drug-driven crazed uh, the straw of his own community. It's not going to highlight the black men that are doing things that are remarkable, that are doing things that are pro-social, that are doing things that are exceptional. They're not going to talk about that. They're not going to present that image. It doesn't fit the narrative that they're writing that controls the social uh the social dynamic and how we are viewed amongst ourselves and how we deal with one another amongst ourselves, but also how we deal with those who can have an impact on how we move 
in the near future and the distant future. And that's our responsibility to stop the narrative, to present who we are in force. By doing that, we shake the very foundation and the core of this racial caste system. Without that, we're left with sitting up and looking at what we are trying to do crumble before our eyes because we refuse to, to, to become engaged. I've written 25 books, probably close to 10,000 videos. I can't tell you how many lectures I've done in so many different places with so many different organizations. I can't tell you how many academic articles I've written, but I know it's over a thousand, over 30,000 prose articles. I've given so much of myself to this. This thing is, you, 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 you have to, at some point, find something that is not only worth living for, but worth dying for. Dr. King, uh, when he realized that he may have moved us in the wrong direction, when he told Harry Belafonte that I believe I may have uh, integrated my people into a burning house, he began a new campaign. And when you read his memoirs, he knew that it probably was going to lead to his death, his early demise. And there's a quote that I hold dear to my heart. I have many uh, differences with the way that a, a lot of things that Dr. King did early in his activist career. Uh, but I am a staunch supporter of the last year and a half of his life where he started to move us towards reparations where he started to declare that america owes us a debt and when he started to move us towards financial responsibility and awareness he was taken away from us and uh but there's something that he said in the midst of a time when he knew that where he was leading us now would probably end in his demise and he said that a man that does not have something for which he is willing to live isn't, I mean, a man that does not have something for which he is willing to die is not fit to live. And at some point we have to have that thing. We've got to have that something to live for, something that wakes you up every morning and gets you going. But you got to have something that you will stand on to the point of death or your character will not stand up in this thing that we are we are fighting this war that we are waging uh, for survival, for empowerment, for liberation. It's not going to be what we write on posters when we're protesting. It's not going to be what we type in the comment sections of posts on social media. It's going to be the lives we live, the lives we touch, the changes we make, the intentions that we hold true in our behavior that's going to make the difference. I am challenging you. It's time out for the whining and complaining. It's time out for the finger pointing. It's time to take action. You need to be supporting programs that work. You need to be supporting individuals who you can look at and say, they have been about this. I can see it in what they're doing. I can, I, I, I can, I can lay my hands on it, whatever it is, but you're going to have to get behind people. You're going to have to, in many instances, become one of those people. We need soldiers. We need boots on the ground. We need people who aren't afraid to speak the truth. We need people who aren't afraid to get in the midst. Do you know that every time I go in the community and I deal with these kids, I go in with, with the understanding that I could easily lose my life or be forced to take theirs. That alone will stop the average man. I'm not finna do that. I'm not gonna do that. But see, I was alive when we lost our boys. I was a young buck myself, but I was alive. And I, I can go back and I can look at how it happened not because I've read it, not because I've done the research, not because I've written on it, because I was alive and I watched it. I watched the decimation of the black family. I watched it. I then watched the destruction of the black male psyche. I watched it. I saw it. And I saw how they came at us. And I saw that we didn't have anything to stop it. And I saw what they were doing. That they took our, our, our hope and our identity. The, the, the very yearning of a man is to belong. Is to be needed, is to be respected, and they robbed us of it all and then put us in the most horrible situations we could be in and let us do what they knew we would do. This was what you call social engineering. This wasn't an accident, but what we're going to have to do is engineer a plan of recovery. 
And we're going to have to be willing to do something that I've talked about also for a very long time. That is, we are going to have to be willing to plant seeds as men that we may not be that we may not live long enough to see come to fruition. That means we're going to have to get out of the instantaneous mindset of needing our bats, our backs padded, personal accolades, people acknowledging how awesome we are, and we're going to have to sit up and say, you know what? I may have to pour into a kid that by the time what I put in them takes hold, I may not be here. Or I may be so old and out of the picture that nobody even remembers. You got to be willing to do that. So you got to get out of yourself to touch something bigger than yourself, to push far enough that it touches the people that you should love seminally. And what I'm talking about seminally is, seminally is, Right now, although my great-great-grandkids, I uh, hope and pray, Lord, I don't have any great-grandkids. My oldest ain't but 15, so that can't be. But, so I have no great-great-grandkids for sure. But my great-grand, but my great-great-grandkids are present seminally. I have produced them already in my children. Who have produced it in their children, giving me my grandchildren. And ultimately, down the line, my lineage will produce something that came out of me. I have a responsibility to them, even though I'll never meet them. But see, that's something that has to be taught in manhood. That's something that has to be instilled and inculcated into the very nature and psyche of a man. And we're missing that and we're losing great ground because of it. This is my challenge. It's time to step up. It's time to get behind things. It's time to have a plan, a blueprint, uh, an agenda, a code of conduct. Emotional eruption is not a plan. Being reactive all the time is not a plan. Not being prepared for whatever's out there is not a plan. It's time for us to stand up. It's time for us to be aware there's so much out there. I I mean, in my book, Born in Captivity, I lay it out. In my book, Undoing the African-American Mind, I lay it out. In Academic Apartheid, I lay it out. In, in, in The Miseducation of Black Youth, I lay it out. All the way back to book number one, The Invisible Father, Reversing the Curse of a Fatherless Generation. I've been laying it out for decades. I've been on the ground for decades. I am an on-call person. You don't, Every day I'm getting somebody say, hey, this is going on. Can you help? every day those are my people I'm going to war my question is are you going to go with me are you going to get boots on the ground with me I need you are you going to help me fund the network development of a program that can literally in 20 years change the trajectory of the black struggle yeah it's going to take time you're not going to undo 158 years of uh, horrible programming and and uh, psychological disruption and psychological warfare and social uh, engineering and all the things that are taking place in 15 months is going to take work. It's going to take a generation of literally inculcating the proper pro-social behaviors and expectations of manhood into a generation of boys and then covering them and shielding them away from everything that's being thrown at them to change them and introduce them into a negative mindset of themselves, a negative idea of themselves. It's going to take that. I've started it. I've seen what socializing young black males will do. It reduces their chance of uh, incarceration. It reduces their chance of becoming violent. It increases their chance of becoming functionally capable of supporting a family, a willingness of creating a family. It even increases their chance of starting their own business. This is the work that I've put together. This is the work that I have embraced. This is the work that we can literally change with. But it's not going to happen sitting back looking and expecting, expecting the next person to do it. Don't think the next person is going to donate what we need. Donate it. I've given of myself for over 20 something years into a program to keep it afloat. I mean, me taking from my businesses 
and making sure that this thing works. I'm challenging you now. I'm unapologetically calling everybody to the mat. We love to have these beautiful posts about how pro-black we are and how much we love being black and how much we love. But we also like those posts where we love to tear in to young black males who have made uh, some horrible decisions and talk about how horrific they are. We love to talk about how horrible black men are with their women. And you know I'm one of the brothers that I'm, I'm not for it. I don't stand for it. You can't be in my circle mishandling a woman. Absolutely not going to happen. But I know it's happening out there. I see it and I look at it and I don't like it. But here's the thing. You can either complain about it. You can talk about it. You can deride black men. You can make them the worst people in the world. Or you can sit up and say, we got to change how we're developing them. We've got to change what we're exposing them to. We've got to change their developmental processes to introduce them to the beauty of their manhood in totality instead of allowing them to maladapt to the demands of the world and become a force of negative uh, destruction. That's on us. And it's nothing you can do to escape it. You can pretend that you're not a part of it. You can pretend that it's not your problem. But the one thing I can tell you about this world, I've been here long enough now that I can speak on it. You can pretend it's not your problem, but I can tell you that the, when, you can, when you consistently keep pretending that something that you have a responsibility to is not your problem, that problem eventually ends up knocking at your door. I can tell you that you can you can sit up and think you're going to escape it, but it's going to knock at your door. I would rather go out and confront it. I would rather go out and be a force to deal with it. So even if it does come knocking at my door, I know it wasn't because I didn't do what I could. So on that note, look, I'm going to get ready to get off. Um, that's my challenge. On that note. You guys have an unbelievable remainder of your day, and I'm going to try to do this thing.